come to Maine back in 1970, actually, the, the winter, the big snow winter, mm -hmm. and we're living in Gorham, and uh, uh, my wife was teaching in, in Portland. But uh, I got into graduate school at the Darling Center and uh, came up in 1971 and rented uh, both in Walpole and then later in Nobleboro, but then decided, yeah, maybe it was the time to, to go and try to find something more permanent. And uh, so both Natasha and I were looking, and uh, coincidentally, we found places at the same time. I had gone down to South Bristol, and somebody showed me a, uh, nine acres of land on Seal Cove for $12,000. At the same time, Natasha was doing life, uh, life drawing in Wiscasset, and Nancy Rosenthal had been talking about Whitefield. So uh, they must have been talking, and Carl Fury said, well, he knew of a place. And uh, so Carl brought Natasha up to uh, our place on the townhouse road. So Natasha came up and fell in love with the river, and versus the ocean. Versus the ocean. And there were certain things to be said. But of course, if we'd bought both pieces of land, I wouldn't be depending on Social Security. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that same piece of land was subdivided into two houses, which are probably million dollar houses. Yeah, easy. So uh, Natasha came up, and we walked down to the river. And uh, uh, the what it, the story on that is I think Billy Hall had bought this probably 100 acres of land yeah, along I the river that. there and had uh, a venture, I, I'd heard for $900 back, you know, probably before they even had electricity or paved road on the townhouse, but I'm not sure, probably in the 50s. Yeah, I think he bought in the 50s. And uh, <clears throat> he then sub, uh, cleared it and subdivided it into uh, eight, I think it's eight, seven or eight lots, and so and sold them for a thousand bucks a piece, which was, you know, pretty hard to beat. Pretty hard to beat, but um, you know there were other good deals at that time. We're talking the early, very early seventies, and uh, so this this couple of Johnsons who came from San Francisco had built a small house there. Uh, they stayed in a little shack behind it and then built the, a house. It wasn't quite complete, but then decided they wanted to move on. So that was the house that was available. And price was right. Was, I think it was 16.5 or something like that. With 12 acres, 12, 13 acres going to the river. And so we bought. and. Uh, the, the day we walked down to the river, uh, we got down to the edge there and we saw a guy fishing. And uh, he sort of acknowledged our presence and we were talking, but he kept on fishing and that was Walter Kinsley. Oh, so he created you? Yeah, by I think a couple of years. And he had bought what was the old cottage uh, hospital. Cottage hospital and I think in 100 acres of land for reputedly $10,000. And so he had pretty well established himself and was already <clears throat> doing what we became to know as back to the land. Uh, I don't know exactly what kind of livestock he had at that time, but eventually he had cows and he had a horse, a draft horse, and bought tractors. and. And uh, eventually had pigs, and as we know, he started to, actually he and I started the, the prototype for his smokehouse. Oh, really? It was in the field where uh, Jerry Maldovan built his house, and it was just a small shack with a old, uh, wood, uh, I think it was just a barrel stove or down below, and the smoke was mm -hmm. piped up through there, and a friend of mine was raising salmon. So I, we got in, he was giving us some pan-fried salmon, and we were trying to, mm -hmm. to smoke those. Did that work out well? Uh, well, we ended up taking them down to Boston to a market, and uh, 
they took them and were interested and came back the next week and said, how'd you like the salmon? I said, good. They said, well, would you like to buy more? Not really. Uh, we ate them. We didn't consider ourselves back to the land. Uh, Natasha was interested in art and I was still a graduate student. But we started in a small way, you know, we, like everybody else, we had a few chickens and a couple of pigs over the years and then I raised a dozen or so sheep there just uh, for a hobby. And, uh, but at that time, uh, our, the neighbors and our, you know, became our contemporary buddies who were very much into the going into it. Uh, 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 Walter had his farm, Jimmy Sillen had moved in over on 126. Rosenthal's, Joe and Nancy Rosenthal were sort of the original, Richard Not Kerwin, Richard. and Richard, Richard had started a, a shingle mill there mm -hmm. out back, and he and Diane were out doing shingles, and Joe was playing music, but I would say the focal point was both Walter and it turned out Jackie um, found came and moved in there and and Jimmy Sillen right. on 126 they were basically in for the the, the long run right. as it appeared at that point and whatever money they had was invested in livestock and uh, and then they sort of attracted other people in into that mix and it became sort of a uh, social uh, yeah. party group as well and uh, you know everybody was struggling to try to find different ways of making it work yeah. and, uh, and to a certain extent it was relying on some of the older people here and their their knowledge and sometimes their equipment probably to you know how, how, to, how to do things as I remember uh, Pug actually, although at a certain point he had differences of opinion with a lot of the mm -hmm. people moving in, he had a certain respect for and appreciation like yes, did. for Walter, and uh, they would sit up back and chew the fat and, and probably drink a little whiskey or Thanks. something <laughs> like that, and uh, from that they would learn. Uh, some of the techniques and, and and if you went to the, any of their parties uh you know they were all talking about their their tractors you know yeah. and uh their power takeoffs you know and that circle began to grow that people were coming in of that same sort of 30s age group it was past the vietnam period so there wasn't that huge uh political need to get away from serving or hiding in the bushes anymore but it was sort of a uh, it was it was still the land was still relatively inexpensive uh, people could try to figure out how they could live away from the cities so we started to get well Peter Froelich Peter and Froelich and Beth arrived uh, Mike Kimball and, and Ron Barassa they were both from mm -hmm. Worcester Auburn area mm -hmm. uh, they arrived they all had a little bit of different uh, perspective on the world, but part of the idea was that they could build their own house on relatively inexpensive land and maybe dabble in some of the you know farm thing. But uh, basically, that was uh, more amongst uh, the, uh, the that group of Kinsley and 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 Sillen that were sort of the core of that. And the other part of it, there, was, there were people here that had come somewhat earlier that joined into that group, like uh, George Ferguson and yes. Robin Johansson. Yep. Uh, obviously, Robin is now a full-time farmer, but uh, his, his father had moved here, and he had come even earlier than we had. And George, George's father, Stuart, had moved up here, I think, in the 50s. Oh, I think he predates that. I think he goes back into the 30s. Really? Yeah. And Jimmy was a musician. And I don't know if you ever got out to those, but there were these harvest parties mm -hmm. out on the Banner Road. 
where they'd sort of set up a bonfire and somehow get amplification out there and play rock and roll. And it was uh, Jimmy and Midnight in the chairs, and, and Mike Kimball was in that group, and Russ Johnson, and they had floating bass players, but they came and went. <clears throat> but uh, that sort of brought in the whole other part of the community as well. The kids that had grown up here, the Morins mm -hmm. and uh, the Boyntons, mm -hmm. David Boynton, well, they ended up living out there, as did John Robbins. But <clears throat> that was sort of a focus and, and ended up merging some of the, the kids that had grown up here in the same age group. Uh, on the social end of things. <clears throat> then there was another wave, and that sort of started uh, in the early 80s. And I remember when Bambi first arrived on the scene, and she had, was living out in a camp on the other side of Clary Lake, and doing honey, I think, over there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so then she and Tracy got together, and I'm not sure how they were able to land purchase land out on what we call Hollywood Boulevard, but that set a new wave of sort of agricultural interest uh, in the community, and they had far more resources than they did uh, uh, the Kinsleys or the Sillins to make these things happen. They had money to put behind what they were doing. We'd, if they were calling us hippies, I suppose they'd be calling them yuppies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, um, you know, there was that. that group sort of melded, and Howie and Karen, and uh, that that sort of all came together. And as you said, uh, the Bells, when they moved in, they weren't <clears throat> they weren't much into farming, and and uh, but the the social groups did meld pretty well. But I think what was happening in the, <clears throat> as the 80s came along, it became apparent to uh, <clears throat> Richard Kurowitz or, and Diane, possibly, probably Diane first, that you weren't going to make a lot of money running a shingle mill. And, uh, and things began to sort of turn a corner at that point. Even Walter, I mean, he had started a smokehouse business and you know what happened with that is basically after a few years the place burned down and that sort of went into disrepair but <clears throat> so that, that i think does distinguish those two groups the uh, uh, bambi and tracy did have the wherewithal they could expand uh, but when in as the 80s came along the moneyed economy became just more apparent yep. We have Tom and Paula Benny, who came along sort of as Walter was finishing out, and uh, they they kept on that same ideal with very little money. Yeah. And the stories we could tell about all of them are, are quite unique and uh, and interesting because they were struggling. It was no easy path. Mm -hmm. And I remember Walter one year. He and Ron Barassa decided they were going to sell Christmas trees, and uh, he had. A lot of back acreage, and they had been taking firewood from years, but there were a lot of fir trees there. So uh, they decided, well, we'll just cut down a bunch of these firs and cut off the tops and drag them to Portland <laughs> to sell them. <laughs> it didn't work. You know, they got to Portland and realized they, they had skinny, scrawny fir tops, and they couldn't sell them either. And I think. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Lori Brandt was sort of involved with that whole escapade, and uh, she couldn't sell them either. So there were a lot of trial and error kinds of things to make money, and of course there was the, the more uh, <clears throat> illegal aspects of efforts to, to bring in cash, and uh, which who knows, they may still be. They're not selling any, sending any helicopters over anymore. That's a pretty small operation <laughs> <laughs> compared to me.